and go forward. And occasionally you might think, well, you know, perhaps that wasn't such a clever thing to do. But good comes out of it all the time. Forge forward. Welcome, Francis. Great to have you on the show. So, Francis Aitkins, renowned British chef of your era, actually of a number of eras. You've built a hugely successful career over the past 40 years, um, including being the first female British chef to win at Michelin. Well, I just Star. correct I mean, you there. Um, oh, really? I'll just correct you there. I'm not sure that is correct. I know it's on the internet, but I'm not convinced that that, that I am. And, uh, but I've certainly had a Michelin star, yes, for so many years. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So, Francis, you have been a pioneer. I mean, one in how you cook and how you construct in the kitchen. You've been focused for many years on seasonal, local, working within the geographic context that you're in. And that's become mainstream today and many have followed your path. But also notably, you have been bashing down walls and ceilings with your frying pan, metaphorically, and bringing women into the professional kitchen because that wasn't always the case. When you started, it certainly wasn't the case that women played a major role. It was a very male-dominated environment. But I'd like to go back to the early days when you were a young person. You always loved cooking. You felt it was a calling. Tell me about that. Um, well, from uh, from an adolescent, from a child, um, it was something that I think brought me inner satisfaction. And you probably don't realize that as a child what this is, what the strength is, but it's something that I think as a child you feel compelled to do. And uh, my mother was a very artistic person, and I think probably she in some way understood that. And so therefore as a child I did the domestic cooking. I used to cook for neighbours. I made cheese as a young girl. It was all-consuming, and I really wasn't very interested in many other things, to be honest. It's quite interesting, isn't it, how those passions inform what yes. comes later or indeed even not recognising yes. them because we don't really recognise them as a young person, the impact that that can have, you know, on, on a career when we maybe don't follow our instincts and intuition on what we really love and what makes us happy and what we'll definitely come back to that. So, Francis, you, you took quite an unusual path at the time, for a young person, you went into hotel management. Well, only, um, you worked that in was, I went in to do that because my father insisted. I came from a sort of middle class family, and he was of the opinion that it really wasn't a. I seemed to be dominated in my life by men who are telling me what what I should do, and he he didn't really think that it was a very suitable job for a young woman to become a cook, basically. So how did you, because you subsequently went on to work in kitchens yes. and well, you, you worked um, at a famous restaurant, The Box Tree, and you, and you at 17 ended up in the kitchen, which was highly unorthodox at the time. How did you manage to do that? What was the driving force? Well, the driving force to get that particular job in The Box Tree, that I was just a kid and I said I'd wash up and, um, and I, I got paid for it, which was great. And um, they needed wash ups. And at the time I was very, very naive and didn't realise that the kitchen was a totally gay kitchen anyway. So they didn't like yeah, it yeah. at all. And uh, But if I was going to wash up, that was okay. And then I would sort of hang around and I was there for when they had dramas, you know, when a chef didn't come in or, or there were short of staff at the front of house. I managed to worm my way into what, to me at the time, was just a theatre. It was just, just, just wonderful. I, I would have just done anything to stay there. And I worked there for a few years as, um, as an ad adolescent. And every Saturday I would be summoned to the office and they would say, they would list all my <clears throat> mistakes, everything that I'd done and say, well, I 
we won't be able to pay you for this and we won't be able to pay you for that. And that is extraordinary. I'm a sister. That's fine. Don't worry. I don't oh need my to gosh. be paid. <laughs> is it, you, you can't believe me. Believe it, believe it today. You really can't. I mean, child labour today, know. right? Honestly. <laughs> and don't you know, the hours that young people can work and that sort of thing, you know. Um, I used to work all hours. And, and But I just loved it. And you know what? I think at that age, to me, it demonstrated, it made my future. This was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be involved in this theatre, if you like. It's a beautiful analogy, isn't it, to kind of the artistic world because it's its own artistic yes. platform, isn't yes. it, in a way? And I think there's something about naivety because if you knew then what you subsequently knew, perhaps it, it, it could have gone one of two well, ways. Well, yes, well, you'd right? be prejudiced, wouldn't you? You'd be automatically prejudiced. Well, prejudiced. Mm. Right. And that kind of, I mean, in a way, it's all humanity in front of you because you've got a cast of characters operating to get things done right and from that you went on and you worked in Scotland and you worked in the famous uh, La Glace in Copenhagen Mm -hmm. uh, perfecting your Mm -hmm. chef pâtissier Mm -hmm. skills and the wind was at your back you were going places and you were 23 and it all stopped you got married and you retired in a way from your career Take me back to that time and and the feelings that you had about that. Um, I think once again it was to do. I got married because I I was absolutely fascinated at the time with um, a sophisticated life that I hadn't come across before, and I could re- and uh, I related to that through going to expensive restaurants and seeing a world that I wouldn't have seen if it hadn't have been for for that relationship. And right. looking back on it, looking back on it, of course I was I was far too young to get married. But I was absolutely once again fascinated by wonderful wines, vineyards, beautiful restaurants things that I normally I would have never have had the opportunity. And my husband would at that time um, take me to a dress shop, for instance, every other girl's dream and say, just kick her out. And I really, you know, most girls would think, oh, how fantastic. I just thought, oh, I suppose so. You know, I would be much rather gone to a really super uh, uh, restaurant on the other side of the world and be kitted out in that way. So I had a very privileged, at an early stage, I had a very privileged lifestyle. And what George did for me was he gave me a social education. So therefore, um, not only did I wear lovely clothes, uh, he sent me to uh, modelling school to learn how to speak almost like a finishing school because for him I had to be the great sounds ridiculous now but it was true at the time I had to be the great uh, escort if you like and you had to look inside the part you had That's to be right. worldly it, beyond That's your right. years because you simply hadn't had the life That's experience right. or exposure at that exactly. point so how did it feel at the time fitting into that new job spec in yeah. a way. It was good at the time. I, I mean, to start with, the first few years, they were exciting, they were different. I saw uh, I saw so, so, there was so much creativity going on. It, it was great. But the downside was, of course, it was the marriage. It was a disaster. And then I needed to work uh, and I couldn't understand. Did you miss it when, you know, having, having come so far at a very early sure. age, doing something sure. you loved? Oh, yes. Did that, did that, did you just feel a gap because you weren't doing, you weren't totally. doing what you were meant to be doing effectively? Totally. So we entertained every week. I had a d- dinner parties once or twice a week. So, so, so we did it that way, which George absolutely loved. He was in his total element. 
he just loved it. It was a form of showing off. You know, it was uh, absolutely brilliant. And so therefore, if you like, um, I was again enjoying and learning as I went on another skill, another, so another social skill. And all additive, right? I mean, it all adds into the journey yeah. in some respects. Oh, yes. You know, some might say that the, the path and the steps on it are ordered. And I think all these things play a role in, in who we become and, and how we live our lives in some respects. So over time, Francis, you know, you, you reached an ending in that relationship and you weren't exactly at ground zero, but you hadn't worked external to your home and family and personal life for a while how did you get going again I mean what was your frame of mind and, and what did you do well I was, again again it's I think it's a, it just wouldn't happen today but it's a form of naivety I decided sort of for various reasons that that I, I was going to have to sort of finish this relationship and it was down to myself to do it. And I was totally stupid. I just sort of left without anything. And then realized that my credit cards didn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't got any money, literally. And so... Were you frightened, no, though? Really, I mean, no. You I was so desperate. I've always been rather a practical, I suppose, a responsible, really, person in that sense, because I thought, right, well, I'll work. And so I, I started, which made everybody absolutely furious at the time. I got a job um, cooking, supplying food for a pub. And uh, for that, I got cash. And so I got some money. That was as simple as that. So you got going. Yeah. And I met my current husband of now, what, 40 years, we used Yay. to go there for, he was on his own, and used to go there for supper. Oh, my God. So that pub is in that your is memory right. forever, right? right? Having brought the two yes. of you together. Yes. Francis, can I ask you, you, you just took the step. You know, again, you just, just went on and kept going and just did it. You acted, right? And I think sometimes when people are in challenging situations, there is fear, right? Like what's going to happen to me? Can I survive on my own? Can I leave that job and follow my passion? Can I leave that relationship, retire out of it and, and move ahead and be happier? But it's almost the fear is the block. What would you say? I mean, you just did it, but what would you say to people who feel they need to take a step, whatever that step is, but something quite fundamental, and, and they're just not sure how to go about it. What would your advice be? Trust your instincts and to be brave and don't look back. I never have had one rule in life, I so don't look back. When you start yeah, looking when you start looking back, then the doubts creep in. So I go forward. And occasionally you might think, well, you know, perhaps that wasn't such a clever thing to do. But good comes out of it all the time. Forge forward. If you forge forward, there's always good and you learn by every little experience. I think that's so true. And I love that forge forward. That is just such great expression, isn't it? Well, Francis, you certainly forged forward. Um, you know, this that courage and tenacity that you showed, even if it didn't feel like it at the time, in making that step, which took you on another journey of a thousand miles, effectively, you know, that's been evidenced throughout your career. You've gone on, you've you've worked in restaurants, you've launched restaurants, you and your husband had a, had a country house hotel. It strikes me that running a restaurant is probably one of the most difficult things you can possibly do. You know, it's a bit like running a multinational. You've got supply chain, you've got marketing, you've got uh, finance, you have human resources, you've got customer service. And then when you get a star, as you did, Every single day, you've got to keep that star in place. You've got to keep coming back and perfecting your craft and keeping everyone happy. Um, how did you cope over all the years with the relentless pressures of high performance? Um, if I'm very, very honest, I've now plateaued. And that's one of the great pluses of age. I didn't. I used to, I started off by by being very stressed. I, li I lived a very stressful life. And 
But I always felt, I always felt I had to dig myself out. And my life, I think, was just about digging myself out all the time. And therefore, in one sense, in my case, it stopped me from ever being at all egotistical. It was just a relief to have survived that week. I'm a very sort of last minute person and I do well under pressure. If I'm, it's a bit like doing your school homework, you know, lastminute.com. That's, yeah, that's the yeah, way it is. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, um, you're, you're, the pressure builds up in, in your mind and that's when I think people can become a little unstable. Well, I think it's, I think in your industry as well, you know, you have kept going and thriving, you know. I mean, clearly now you're in a different phase with what you're doing, and we'll come on to that. But so many um, notable chefs and and perhaps less renowned ones, but highly competent and highly, highly accomplished, have burnt out. No. Uh, they've yeah. crashed simply because of the relentless pressures. What has been your secret to just you know, you'd be digging yourself out over these years. What else have you done to just keep yourself on yeah, track? I, I think um, nobody's really asked me this question before. And I don't have a uh, secret as such. I think what I've always said to my chefs and to my staff is when you have a service that's going wildly wrong, one thing at a time, one thing at a time, one order at a time, however long it takes, just make sure that what you're doing, you're doing well and it's going satisfactorily because panic can set in and you can mess up everything. So again, it's for John, one thing at a time and try and keep super cool. That doesn't mean to say that I haven't spent many nights wondering if I'll ever get to sleep worrying um, with those sort of pressures. But it stops. It is certainly my saving grace has been always, it doesn't matter who you are, how successful you are. You know, there's always the bottom line. You're as good as your last meal. So so you're as good as your last right. piece of work. And that, for me, uh, gives me a little sanity. Absolutely. And I love I love that advice that you've given to so many that have worked with you over the years, because effectively, it's about taking the right next yes. step, yes. you know, when everything's really challenging, just one step that you take that is going to, you know, move you forward. What have you learned about yourself during all these years of, of you know, highs and, and a few lows, but with, with the intense pressure that is in the kitchen, you know, incessantly? I'm probably too impetuous. I'm very impetuous. And that's got worse as I've got older. I sort of almost feel I must do it uh, and I can't wait. I must get on with things. So I think that's it. And probably um, I'm a bit too practical. I think if I had taken in my life uh, more risks, I might have got where I wanted to be more successful. I don't know. I don't know, but uh, I do know I am very impetuous. So interesting. And that's probably turbocharged you to keep going as well. And, you know, I'm sure you've taken many risks, which is the sign of a great entrepreneur of which you are one and where, frankly, you were a teenage entrepreneur making artisanal cheeses in your parents' cellars, right? That's kind of where it probably started. But you went on and you and your husband discovered the York Arms, which became you know, an incredible uh, accomplishment and achievement of you together uh, over many years, a beautiful restaurant in Yorkshire. And you sold out and stayed on a little bit longer before you came on to your latest venture. But at the time when you and your husband decided to exit that business, and I believe your husband retired or considered retiring, you know, you've been quoted as saying that that's something you'd never do. What was your thinking having come out of that era at the, the York Arms and, and everything that that entailed. Well, I think I think everything has its has its time, and for me, it was time to do something different, to be inspired. Um, life has changed considerably um, since COVID, 
and it was time to wander into pastures new. And what did that mean for you when you were sitting there and looking out? What, how were you feeling about what that might look like in a new world order effectively, particularly since COVID? Well, it was going to be difficult. It was going to be challenging. It was going back to start again, um, which um, I've enjoyed because I'm dealing now with a, a, a different a different sort of a different level of business. And I uh, feel my past experience can add to that to bring the standards up uh, to what we expect today, which are very, very different to the standards that I started off. So if we come on to food for a moment, what do you like to eat? What are, your, what are the foods that you like to make for you? And what are your observations referencing the point you just made about how the world has changed, how standards have changed, how preparation food types have changed? Well, I mean, in our world, in this country, it always irritates me slightly when uh, people of an older generation say, oh, uh, you know, we have such a bad reputation for food. In actual fact, we're now, we became one of the leaders in uh culinary activity you know in our yes, in our, yes. our food and by taking on all multitudes of in- influences i think then the problem has now become we have so many influences we're not sure really in which direction uh, to go and i think a little has been lost about eating being able to eat a balanced diet just a little of everything. And by doing that, it stops all the allergies. Allergies and things occur when people only eat one sort of food and obviously maybe eat maybe too much processed food and not enough fresh food, or they eat too much fat and so therefore you can't eat, you have to stop eating it. So um, I think now, uh, personally, I like a, a balanced balanced diet i think fresh food although it's a bit of a pun but uh, fresh food is the only way forward even if you just buy some fresh veg at home and cook it up in a in a pan you know simply as you can is much better than a ready prepared meal so uh, i think people have just lost the way a bit on how to eat fresh food and in actual fact prepared food takes very little work. Why do you think that is? I mean, for example, 20 years ago, you would not have walked down the road in any city or village and seen people wearing holding paper cups yeah. with uh, you know, which can't be recycled because they've got black tops or red tops, which are unrecyclable, even though we know recycling doesn't even work. You know, it would have been considered to be inappropriate. Well, well, almost, that is whereas now, people, a young girl never eat in the street. Yes. Right. So what, what, you know, obviously we can talk about the pace of technology of which I'm a huge fan, but you know, we have to still live our lives in a way which are good for our health and walking down the road, being on a phone, holding a coffee and eating at the same time is probably not great for digestion. But what has shifted in your view from, from your lens on life in your area of expertise? What's happened? Um, well, I mean, this is society, isn't it, that's dictated that you walk down the road on your phone and drinking a cup of coffee or something. And you don't have to do that. It's a lifestyle choice. And eating and um, is, is something that should be, in my book, orga- an organized part of your day. It's important. Uh, it's important to your body. It's important for your equilibrium and I think probably it's the pressures of commerce that has made you walk down the road drinking and eating rather than sitting down for 15 minutes and having a proper cup of coffee with a piece of toast or whatever. And do you find time you know with your life of running yeah. restaurants to sit? Because I run out you of make steam the time. yes no no I have yeah. a I have a very organized daily routine and I think that's important for long levity, quite frankly. 
I think all these cancers and terrible illnesses and ailments and things that people can't eat are just through a disorganized lifestyle. And what 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 um, are the tips that you would give someone who's looking at their habits? There's an awful lot of talk about habits these days. I mean, like Aristotle talked about habits, so it hasn't just happened in the past five minutes, right? But there are many more books on habits. You can buy them in the airport when you go on a flight. And some of them are quite good. But it's really about, you know, good habits make you the person you are. You become your yeah. habits. And they're essential to leading a good life, an examined life, a healthy life, uh, a, a, a measured life, I guess, an enjoyable life. What, 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 what are your top tips, given the length and success of your career, that have served you as your daily habits? I think, um, first of all, I would say I think discipline um, is is an important thing. Not all of us are very disciplined. I'm not personally very disciplined. But um, I have certain responsibilities and a life that I have to fit these responsibilities in. So I have to have some form of organization in it. And I think that's what it is. It's about personal, daily organization. And as far as food's concerned, um, I run out of steam, literally. I regard myself as an engine. So I know I need to have some breakfast. I know I need to have something in the afternoon. I know I would like a glass of wine, and a glass of wine perks you up. The the discipline there is not to have too many, and then because then you suffer the next day. So it's just about organisation in your lifestyle and encompassing, you know, what is in what work you have in 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 your life. It's a fairly practical solution, really. It's just whether you're uh, able to work that out. And obviously, the older you get, you abuse your body rather when you're younger, I think. Um, the older you get, you just have to fall into this sort of category to keep on going, to keep on surviving. But the important thing is keep moving, keep going. Keep going. And Francis, tell me about your latest venture, Paradise and what you're excited about today. We're now coming into spring, my favorite season, and we grow everything. I grow. I made one garden at the York Arms. I've now got a field and made another garden. And Amazing. for me, bringing that produce in and serving it in a lovely way is, is a joy every day. And so we are making... Making our food for the day, basically. And that is um, something that I'm fortunate enough to be able to stand there and do till I drop. I never, ever think how tired I am when I'm working because it's all consuming. So I'm lucky. And I know I'm lucky to be like that. I know that. And um, what's on the menu today? Sorry, love no, food. No, You're making well, me hungry. We've got, we've got <laughs> our... our very successful cabbage cake with um, and citrus and ginger dressing. Lots of fresh Delicious. vegetables and herbs on the menu. We've got our, our little stuffed dumplings that we do with beef, with beef inside, and uh, lots of herby leaves. We've got some good soup. We've got our famous cheese and caramelized onion tarts, which we could sell till the cows come home. So we've got a nice. Rather than what I was doing before, which was a forever a tasting menu, we've got such a variety of food, and I think that's what I'm enjoying. Being having a totally free, free uh, area to cook what I want to cook, and for our guests to enjoy it. No, it's no inhibitions really. Oh, that sounds absolutely yeah. fabulous and divine and delicious, by the way. So, Francis, you find your calling and, you know, you've, you've given some counsel uh, to all our followers about, you know, intuition and following your intuition and keeping moving forward. What's the best piece of advice you've been given in your career? Mm. Um, 
I think the thing when I was a young woman that told me I was very slow and very deliberate and very pragmatic, and uh, I was told that it didn't I speed up, I'd get the sack. And that, for me, I was absolutely horrified at <laughs> that threat of speeding up. So I became, I became a very quick worker after that. So the, I think the best advice is, is to keep, keep cool. Keep cool. Keep, keep cool, cool and keep, keep going. going. And Francis, this is an unfair question, but if, and my last question to you today, if you look out to the horizon, what, what do you want to do that you haven't done yet? Oh, so much. So much. Um, I'm a great walker and uh, I'd love to, I'd love to have the time. I think that's what I'd like. I'd like more time to travel and to walk. And there's so much I want to do. It's just time. It's organizing. I never have enough time. And I think I have a big fear of not having, uh, of never having enough to do. And so I make sure that I, I don't have enough time. And I know retirement isn't on the cards for you, but is part of the travel a desire to tap into more influences? Absolutely. And I think, too, it's also for me, um, I'd like to have the energy. I'm not sure I have all the energy to walk the Munros, for instance. But um, I'm not sure I could, I could do that. And I think that it's the finding of some form of inner peace that I find when I'm hill walking. And that to me is, is wonderful, a wonderful experience. Do you ever, we talk a lot about flow, don't we? And being in the flow when we're doing what we're meant to be doing and maybe using our God-given gifts, we can get into a flow. Do you, do you feel that flow in the kitchen despite the kind of tensions and stresses that arise in, in these environments? Oh, yes, yeah. I think so. Um, Although um, I'm not so, so sure I would describe it as a flow. A kitchen is, isn't, um, although our kitchen is, a, is calm, it is very calm, but it's flow isn't, isn't the right word, word for it because it's a bit spontaneous. Right, right. Francis, what's been the biggest influence on your cooking style? The growth of new shoots and plants. I'm very influenced by plant life. And that's why we're here next to a nursery that grows all their plants. I could not go back, although I've done it, uh, to working in a basement in London. That, that for me, I have to have the right influences to be able to do what I do. And that's to be in the country or in a sunny country, in a, a nature, a naturistic environment. Oh, oh, oh. Well, it's that whole inclusive ecosystem, yes. isn't it, in yes. a way? It's not just the produce in front of you, but it's seeing where it comes from, where it's grown, and everything that's impacted that. And it, the, the, the growth and the development of it, and the purity of it. I think, you know, to eat these things, it, it's mentally... It, it's, a, it's a lovely thing to do. And eating is something that we all have to do. So why not make it stimulating? I couldn't agree more. And in a world where there is overconsumption, often of the wrong things, and, and, and also such compromise of the food supply chain, I mean, 300 years ago, there were probably about 45 or more types of broccoli. Now we see two, for example. We need to return to more varieties. And we don't need we? More to. Different... I feel very passionately about the fact we need to use and eat what is on our doorstep. I went to a very expensive restaurant not so long ago, and the whole thing was about Japanese produce and food. And uh, this place was in particularly beautiful part of our country. And I really felt that although it was an art form, I really felt that we should we really should use what we have. I couldn't agree more. On that note, Francis, thank you so much for being with me today. Pleasure. You Absolute are pleasure. 
a rock star and an inspiration. And I look forward to the next stage and the next exciting adventures. Thank you. Pleasure, Dee. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Dee here. I hope you enjoyed this incredible episode with my amazing guest. I hope you're enjoying the series. We'd love to hear from you. So do DM me and tell me all your stories of second curving. Lots of love.